Welcome to the show, Joseph, or should I call you Mr. Hoffman? <laughs> Joseph is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, wonderful to finally meet you. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been following each other for some some time. And you've just reminded me before we hit record that we actually met at MTNA in Florida, uh, although right. very briefly. So it's going to be great to dive in a little bit more to your story today. And you've I'm made excited. you've made quite a name for yourself as an amazing teacher of students, both online and uh, in person through the Hoffman Academy and your Hoffman Method. Um, and so in a minute, yeah, I'd love to unpack more about how you got there. But first, um, I watched one of your videos on your website where you mentioned that one of the reasons you got into teaching in the first place was that you found that kids love music. I think this is the quote, kids love music, but hate piano lessons. Uh, and you said that really the reason was that, you know, music is, is great fun, but the teaching methods for so many students was, were just really outdated. Um, and yep. then the more I dug in, the more I realized just how aligned our missions are. Um, while I've focused on changing approaches in pedagogy by working with teachers, um, you've created this incredible method and online learning platform uh, all geared at students. Um, but I think there's two sides of the same coin in some ways. What do you feel um, makes your approach different to the other ones that are out there? I think if I had to pick one thing, I really believe in the principle of sound before symbol. And watching some of your videos, I, I see that you have this same belief that kids are at their core, very natural imitators. And if you wanna get a kid started, you don't wanna put a bunch of symbols in front of them because now their brain is overloaded and they can't really make music while they're also trying to decode all these unfamiliar symbols. So instead of putting a book in front of them, we get them making music through imitation, singing, chanting, demonstration. Kids imitate, you get them making music, and then you can show them the symbols later. I believe in teaching kids to sight read. I think that's a very critical skill, but it's not the first thing that we should be starting with. And do you do you relate this to the language learning model? Because uh, I know there's the more research I do about it, there is some um, arguments both for and against. Is music a language that we learn in the same way as language, or are we just kind of saying that because of what you've said that engagement in music before actually reading it's the better way to go? I think there are many parallels to language learning. And I do follow closely what research is being done in say language acquisition, as well as reading, like how kids learn to read their native language. I think there are many parallels. U music is unique in some elements. There's an element of timing that spoken language doesn't have. There's an element of pitch, obviously, but I think there are so many parallels that as music educators, I, I've learned so much. And when I try to apply the science of learning reading, and obviously there's so much more money that gets spent on researching Literacy. reading English, mm -hmm. you know, and so music education, I think if we can piggyback on all of that research, I've seen nothing but positive by treating music like a language. Yes, it's unique. And yes, it requires some unique approaches specified specific to music, but Overall, I, I see a lot of great parallels. I loved another quote um, in a video that I saw where, where you said kids were having so much fun with the Hoffman method that parents were making practice a reward for finishing <laughs> their chores. Now, this could, of course, be just great marketing, but uh, I actually believe <laughs> it, this it could be true. True story. <laughs> true story. <laughs> so why are your kids so excited to play that uh, parents are having to stop them playing until they've done their chores? <laughs> this is brilliant. I mean, yeah, it is a true story. I have to say not all of our parents, say that, obviously, <laughs> you know, or we'd be, you know, world famous. But uh, it, it really did delight me to hear that anecdote from one of our families. And in general, I hear really positive things when parents come back after a first lesson for maybe their second lesson. Almost invariably, they say the minute the kid got home, they ran to the piano and couldn't wait to play the first song that they had just learned. And that, that warms my heart. And that tells me we're doing something right. When kids get home, they see a piano, or parents will also tell me their kids are on vacation, they're at a hotel, they see a piano in the lobby, and they <laughs> run over and they want to play something. And I didn't used to 
hear that from my parents when I first started teaching. And sometimes I wish 20 years ago when I didn't know what I was doing as a teacher, I wish I could go back and give a refund to all those <laughs> students sometimes because I, I have learned so much. And one thing that I learned from my Kodai training is that it's important to get kids playing high quality music from the very start. Most method books, it's about 90% I would say educational content where it was composed for the purpose of teaching, like where is middle C and we're going to focus on C and D and it's a song all in quarter notes and half notes just to teach C and D. I guarantee you in 50 years, no one is going to remember some little song of C and D or, you know, in a hundred years, are we going to be humming any of the tunes from the primer level one of this method or that <laughs> method? No, it's not enduring great music. But what Kodai really believed, the Hungarian educator, was that kids, if you teach them real folk music from the start, folk music is great educational material because the patterns are simple. They're very tuneful. They're very memorable. And so in my method, what I've done is I would say that ratio of 90% educational, 10% like real classic or folk, I flipped that where it's 90% real folk, real classical uh, music that has already been filtered through the test of time. We know it's quality. We know it's tuneful. It's singable. It's memorable. Kids enjoy playing real quality music. And then 10%, maybe things I've composed just to help teach a very specific content. But if you give kids high quality music, they love playing it. Some teachers would say, though, that that uh, music is too hard if they just if you're just trying to learn C and D or quarter notes uh, and the folk tunes got dotted rhythms and things like that in it, wouldn't that yeah. be too hard to play? Isn't that the reason why it's kind of dumbed down? You know, this is a, a funny thing. It depends on how you teach it. Like I, I've seen method books with like a popular series or whatever, and they're playing, let's say, Hedwig's theme or something, and they've dumbed it down to all quarter notes. And the kids will put in the complicated rhythms because they know what it's supposed to That's what to it sounds sound like. like. And yeah. you can't make them play it like the simplified way because it's in their ear. So if you use an ear approach, th that's another thing. Like what great melody do you know that's all quarter notes, half notes, and whole notes? Right. It's just too yeah. boring, right? It doesn't exist. And so we teach kids melodies with eighth notes from the start because that's the fun stuff. Like kids can handle eighth notes if they're taught by ear, use the mm. Kodai, TT, and Ta, or there's a hundred different ways to count rhythms. But if you're trying to teach them one and two and, mm. that's where it breaks down and you're making it too mathematical. Just teach it as a chant or as a sound, let them imitate it. You can show them the symbols later. And that's how you make it fun. And it, it, they, they can handle complexity. I mean, we have kids who are five, six years old playing 16th notes. You're not counting one e and a two e and a. You're just saying ticky 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 ticky. All right. And a preschooler can say ticky ticky. And, yeah, and they love it. It's fun. When I was interested to uh, in, in, introduced, I should say to Kadai over here maybe ten years ago, and I should say for those listening, if you're not familiar with Kadai, it's spelled K O D A L Y. Kadai, that's the guy's name. We use ticker ticker actually for 16th notes over here. Uh, but it really made a lot of sense to me. And I've always incorporated that into my teaching rather than one yenda and one and two end. Um, although I think there's 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 arguments that both can be valuable at different times, I think. Um, so it's it's that's great to hear that that's been part of your uh, your method and approach. I want to get back to teaching, um, talking more a little about playing by ear in a moment. But um, before then, I'd love to just hear the story, if uh, if we could, about how you move from being a single teacher with one student to uh, someone with 200,000 YouTube subscribers <laughs> and a sizable team and your online platform and all that kind of stuff. Can you give us the, the, uh, the background? For sure. So I started teaching piano during grad school. And I was actually studying to be a conductor, wanted to get a DMA and teach university. Uh, but to help pay my way, I started teaching kids in the neighborhood piano lessons. And again, didn't have any idea what I was doing. I just went to the music store, asked, what's the most common method these days? I'd grown up with John Thompson uh, at the store. They said, oh, lots of people like the Faber method. So I tried Faber. 
when I went through music school at the university level, I realized there were a lot of holes in my learning. I, I thought I was a pretty accomplished pianist and had a great music background. Um, I'd done AP music theory and it, like I struggled with ear oral dictation classes and realized that with the sight reading approach I had been taught by, my ear felt really underdeveloped. And then in music history classes, learning that all these past great composers were proficient improvisers. And I was like, why did no one ever bother to teach me improvisation? And I just started it started to really bother me that when I was teaching kids piano, I felt like I wasn't giving them a very well-rounded education that was going to prepare them to be the best musician they could be. Not that I expected them to go on necessarily to become professional musicians, but I wanted to teach in a way that if they did want to go on, I had prepared them mm. to the very best of my ability, but I couldn't find a method that actually included all the things that I thought were important from ear training to composing, to improvising, to transposing. I played for voice lessons sometimes and a teacher asked me, oh, could you transpose this? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I can't transpose. Where's the button on the keyboard to transpose it? <laughs> exactly right, right. <laughs> so... I, I wanted to give my students more than I could find. So I started researching other methods. I studied the Suzuki method and I took some coursework on that, read some books, tried the Suzuki method for a while, but found like it didn't quite seem right for me and uh, didn't really have a strong sight reading component, which I thought was mm. so important. Uh, even though by then I was really believing the, a lot of the ear first philosophies I was learning about, but then studied Kodai and that filled in a lot of the, how do you teach sight reading? And it's by, you do a lot of dictations early on. So you take a, fa a familiar melody and you dictate that. And you can take a simple melody like hot cross buns. You can dictate the rhythm and that's how you introduce quarter notes and eighth notes and quarter rests. It's using a familiar song to teach them unfamiliar symbols rather than the other way around. A lot of method books, they're giving them an unfamiliar symbol. And now they have to use these unfamiliar symbols to play unfamiliar songs. And the kids, just, it's just too much cognitive load for them yeah, yeah. to handle and have fun at the same time. So I, I started working on building my own method when I realized I couldn't find one and quickly uh, I also was teaching some, as a grad student, I was teaching some undergrad music classes and realized I love working with adults as well as kids. So the concept for a music academy kind of married both of my loves. I love working with adults, training teachers, working with musicians, and I love working with kids. So I had this vision for building a music school, training teachers in this new piano method, that I was working on. And uh, once I got that going and had hired a few teachers and started realizing that a lot of families in our area, they would sign up one of their kids, but they I knew they had you know two other kids at home. And when I would ask, they're like, oh, this is just too expensive to have all of our kids in music. And that really made me sad. I was like, ah, you know, these kids could be getting such a great experience and that's when I started tinkering with putting my lessons on YouTube mm. and they started getting views and that one thing led to another. And I slowly have been working on building an online program. So the method where whatever it, I think it works great in conjunction with live teaching. We have our own studio here in Portland, Oregon, with about 200 students who come weekly for a live lesson, but then at home they can keep the lessons or keep the learning going with the online lessons. And then families who say can't afford private instruction, all those videos are there for them as well. Amazing. And, and I think a lot of that content you provide for free, is that right? The video content early on, I decided I wanted to make free. Yes. That's, that's amazing. Well, I, just in order to be able to share music with as many kids as possible and families. Absolutely. It, and we monetize the, the materials. And so it'd be like if you went to a, a teacher and said, or the teacher said, 
I'm going to give you free lessons. You just got to pay for the music books. I wanted to make the barriers as low as possible. So if you're, we've heard from families on the island of Malta in the Mediterranean or uh, kids in India. In We have an adult student in Africa, all around the world who maybe don't have access to a local teacher. Maybe they couldn't afford it. And we wanted music education to be available to everyone. It's amazing. Yeah. What, what a... What a... What a great uh, community service as much as anything that you're able to offer by sharing all Thank this you. for free. I think that's um, really to be commended. Thank you. At, um, this month uh, at Top Music, we're exploring playing by ear and we've already talked a, a bit about this, you know, ear first, listening first, singing first before the reading happens. Um, so we know this is a key part of your approach, it's a key part of my approach. Why has this been a skill that has been ignored for so long in traditional lessons? Given that, as you said earlier, so many of the composers we all love and admire and play were probably ear players, but definitely were improvisers and they were creators, obviously, because that's what the music we're playing. What's happened in the last 200 years? Uh, it's, it's remarkable, right? I mean, so many of the past, all of the, uh, you know, the composers we revere from the early classical period were phenomenal improvisers, creators. And now we kind of think, oh, if you're not a jazz pianist, you're probably not an improviser. And yeah, what what went wrong? Mm. I attribute it a lot to kind of there was this school that came out of like the charity thinking where you've got all these exercises that you've got to learn and you know, charity is great for finger exercises, but to learn them, it's a very sight reading based approach. And I think also music publishing probably has steered it in a direction of like, let's put music in books because books sell and teaching music by ear doesn't really sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then on top of that, I think it's easier to teach from a book in a lot of mm. ways. When I didn't know what I was doing, it was really easy to put a Faber book on my piano and just turn the pages and it did a decent job. I, I have a lot of respect for the Faber method. I think there's a lot of good pedagogy in it. And I don't really have to know how to teach piano if I just turn a page and now, oh, it's time to introduce dotted quarter notes now. Or, you know, and the book, I call it the page turner piano teacher where you're you're just kind of supervising the turning of pages you sit at the bench and you let the book do the teaser that's easy to do and it's the same way i was taught it's the same way most of us were taught it's easy to teach out of a book and it's easy to teach the same way that we were taught but i don't think it's scientifically grounded unfortunately yeah, I, I think you're right. I really hope there's not too many page turner piano teachers. I can't, I'm going to use that phrase, I think. Yeah. I really hope there's not so many out there anymore, given the wealth of resources that are now available and the research that points to that not being the best way to go. I think we're moving that. in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I've been a page turner piano teacher. And if I'm having a bad day, <laughs> that's what I've fallen back on. You know, we all, we all need our, our aids. Well, when I first started talking about teaching with notebooks, so I've got my notebook beginner um, program, uh, I, I very quickly realized that it's all very well for uh, someone like me to say, well, just, you know, put the book away and just do some cool improv stuff. When for teachers who, as you've said, have been brought up with the book method, uh, th they don't know what to do. If there's no book in front, what do you do? And I understood that. And that's when I came up with the whole framework around how to teach with no books um, by giving various prompts and, and using chords and harmony and, and improv. Um, how do you go about introducing playing by ear? Because I want to give teachers listening some, some real ideas that they can potentially use in their own studios. I love getting kids playing by ear using the singing voice. When a kid sings so much is happening in their brain musically. They're having to deal with pitch, they're having to deal with rhythm, they're having to deal with the form, they think of, of phrases, they think of breathing, and it all happens pretty naturally just through the fact that they're singing. So for our earliest songs in the Hoffman Method, 
we always sing them first. And that's another great reason to use real folk music because they're very tuneful. They're singable. They have interesting lyrics and they're memorable too. So we sing it first and then we break it apart. So our very first song that I teach on day one is Hot Cross Buns. And I also love about folk music is a, a thing I love about folk music is they come with a story often. They come from a country. Yeah. You can talk about the country. Hot Cross Buns was a song they would sing uh, in traditionally in England. If you were selling something, you'd have a little song you would sing about it to get people's attention as you walked by. And uh, maybe kids would have even sung this to help the family earn money. And Hot Cross Buns are these kinds of roles that you might sell on Easter and all these bits of context help bring the music alive to kids. Kids love stories, mm -hmm. as we all know. So when you can tell a story, you sing the song, and then we might sing it in solfege, or I might teach them the hand signs. Uh, so we can hear it multiple times in different contexts. And then I might just show them how to move their fingers to mi re do for hot cross buns. And then we can go to the piano. And a lot of times, by the time we go to the piano, they're able to play it on their first try almost without any help from me because we've prepared them. We've put the music inside. And that's, I think, part of why I was saying earlier how a lot of kids run home straight to their piano and can't wait to play it because you've kind of soaked the sponge in the musical water. And now that sponge is just like dripping out. It, they can't help but like have that music come out of them. Soaked the sponge in the musical water. This is a new, <laughs> have you used that before? Or has that just come out? I, I'm trying, I mean, when I do my teacher trainings, I, I use the metaphor that a lot of methods, it feels like you're trying to squeeze a dry sponge. We're like, hey kid, make some music, make some music. <laughs> but you haven't soaked them in any music yet. You're just expecting them to kind of pull it out of a dry sponge. So <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's that's, a really great right. analogy. Um, and I, and I, I wholeheartedly agree that the more immersion you can get in the music before they come to play it, um, the better the outcome will be. What about for teachers who weren't brought up singing themselves, which will be many, because uh, sadly that hasn't been part of uh, many uh, music teachers' experiences. So they haven't got their kids singing from the start. It's yeah. really hard to add later on when they're 10, 11, 12, if they've been learning for three or four years and have never sung a note. Have you ever managed to have success there? Definitely. Oh, so I, I totally get that challenge. And I've learned not to ask kids the question, oh, would you like to sing with me? <laughs> you know, and you're giving them the option of saying no. And so if, if I'm not going to take no, then I'm just like, okay, we're going to sing now. And if they're really uncomfortable with it, maybe they're comfortable humming it. Uh, musicians, and this is what I'll tell my students, musicians sing. Like even if you're a violinist and, or let's say you're a conductor and you need the oboist to play their passage a little more something, the conductor is going to sing it for them. Can you do it more? Da, 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 da. Or, you know, yep. when we're when we're trying to communicate music person to person and you don't have your instrument handy, you sing it. So I try to communicate to my students, musicians sing. It doesn't matter what instrument. If you're a teacher and you don't feel comfortable with your voice, it, we're not, we don't want to model like an operatic style or a super classical style because then kids will try to imitate a big vibrato. You know, we want a simple sound. When I sing for my students, I use a very simple sound. I don't use vibrato. I don't even, you know, think about it. Mm -hmm. I try to keep the sound just really simple. Doesn't need to be beautiful. It just needs to be, you know, the the notes. So yes. don't worry about how your voice sounds. And I would just say get kids singing or humming or whatever you can get them to do. And I, like I said, I don't make it a choice. Mm. Yeah. And, and doing it along with the student, I think the, the worst mistakes I've made before is to go, Oh, can you 
can you sing this back to me? Or and, you know, I mm. play something and they sing it and I haven't sung it and I haven't sung it with them. I think there's kind of multiple steps you can take here. Sing along with them, firstly, get them to hum, play it, use a kazoo. Kazoos are brilliant. Uh, oh, that's a great idea. Because they can- I love that because now they're humming it and they don't even think about the fact that they're vocalizing. Exactly. Like, yeah, that's yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I haven't tried kazoo, but I'm going to try. Kazoo is is great, and I have to credit Lynette Barney, who was on the podcast just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, and actually, I got it out of my drawer. In fact, I've got it right here because <laughs> I knew she was coming on the show. And last time she was on the show, she talked to me about it, and I got it out, and I'm like, "That's not working, wasn't it?" And I'd forgotten <laughs> that. Yeah, you do have to. You have, you have to, to sing into it, hum into it. You're humming. Yeah, yep. to to make it make a sound. And that's been a great one for me for um, for teenagers, particularly boys. So voices are changing and they're feeling a bit awkward. That can be a great way around the whole singing thing, or at least to open it up. Uh, that is brilliant. I love that. I'm taking that. Home. <laughs> go, <laughs> go for it. Um, so what about students who um, I understand using hot cross buns and folk tunes uh, as pedagogically sound ways to introduce things. What about the students when they come in and say, I really want to play this. I've heard it. I listen to it on the Spotify or whatever it is, and there's no music for it. Do you work with students to, to try and play by ear in that sense as well? Absolutely. If you know, motivation, we all know is such a key to successful learning. If you've got a motivated student, a student, it, you, you can't hold them back from making progress. And so it, you always have to make a judgment call. Is this piece too hard for the student? If so, is there a way we can simplify it? Can we just do a short section? If there's a song a kid really wants to learn, I'm gonna try and work with them. And yeah. I love if we don't have the music. I remember the first time I did something by ear was in high school. Some kid in my high school came to me, knew I played the piano and wanted to do this Mariah Carey song. And they didn't have the sheet music. They're like, can you just figure it out? I was like, uh, I don't know. I mean, and I must have listened to it 500, a thousand times, <laughs> figuring it out laboriously one note as, at a time. It was so hard for me, but it was a really great experience. My first song to really learn by ear. And if a kid is dedicated what a great experience that can be. If there's a song, you know, take it, maybe just learn 10 seconds of it. Learn mm. the main lick, the main theme. And then if they want to keep going, a lot of times if a kid wants to do something, but I don't feel like it's super valuable pedagogically, I may assign it as a bonus thing. Hey, work on this on your own. I don't think you need my help with this. Just keep doing it on the side with it and see, see what happens. Mm. Yeah. And, and it comes back to singing as well, because so many... Uh, times pop songs uh, when they're brought into lessons are incre fiendishly difficult to play, but quite easy to sing. Uh, yeah. And that again is why students, the more we can encourage them to sing the better, because if they can sing the pop song they want to play and just play the chords or the harmony, it suddenly yeah. becomes manageable. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so what strategies do you use to, to bring uh, the playing by ear into lessons on a regular basis. I know you obviously you introduce it as a way to teach music from the beginning, but for students that are more accomplished, they've passed their hot cross buttons and things like that. Yeah. How does yeah. it become a, a regular part or does it continue to be a regular part of lessons or as reading takes over, do you do less of it? I would say in the early months, it's a hundred percent by ear. And then gradually as we start learning to sight read, it kind of becomes a hybrid approach for a time where we're both using the ear, where I'm playing it for them, we're singing it, and we're using the score. And eventually we get to the point where it's more of a pure traditional sight reading approach. In order to keep their ear active, there's a lot of different approaches that I love to use. For one, as they continue to learn more and more challenging repertoire, they should keep listening. I know a lot of teachers don't play new pieces for their students. Well, if it's a sight reading assignment, I would agree with that. But if it's a new repertoire piece, I want them to listen to 10 different performances, go on YouTube, find you know 10 different interpretations and really get that music inside of you. I like to think of repertoire and sight reading as two separate tracks rather than one track. Because again, true sight reading, 
No, I don't want to play for them. But I think those also should be slightly easier pieces that they can learn in a few days. I mm -hmm. might give them a whole book that's two levels below them and say, play a different song every day out of this book. I just want them sight reading lots of material that's easy enough that I don't have to guide them through it. And I don't even have to sweat if they learned every note perfectly. Just like when a second grader is learning to read, they're told to go home and just spend some time reading every day. And the teacher's not checking every word. We just want mm. them to gain fluency. And repertoire, on the other hand, I think is a great opportunity to continue strengthening the ear. Let them listen to great performances on YouTube, demonstrate yourself. Uh, so I think just listening to repertoire, giving them assignments to go if you discover something great on one of your playlists or on youtube sending them home to listen to that and then another great thing is doing some lead sheet work like getting a pop song maybe downloading a lead sheet and now you're combining reading chords with some ear work and like you can see the chords but now they're gonna have to listen to the original recording to kind of figure out what they're doing with those chords mm. so it opens up a lot of opportunities style for creativity yeah mm. yeah the the missing piece often for me is that students don't listen to a lot of the music that we get them to play so they'll mm. keep listening to their rap or whatever it is and then want to play jazz at the piano or classical and they don't listen to any of it uh yeah. and it becomes very hard uh and you can you know give a student you know even five different interpretations of any piece by Bach and it will be at any number of different tempi. Uh, it'll yeah. be played with all sorts of rubato or not, or staccato or not, or all this kind of stuff. Right. So it's so important um, that we provide them, but we have to now, and I think more so now than ever, if we want our students to listen, it has to be something that we actually give them and request that they do, because it's not gonna happen organically. And parents aren't listening to music. No one's listening to music out loud in their house. Well, very rare now compared to what it might have been a while ago. Everyone's got their headphones on, haven't they? <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, no, that's very common now. Everyone's in their own musical world. That's right. Well, look, uh, thank you so much, um, Joseph. I, I know we could we could talk much longer about this. Uh, I know people who are listening may well be interested in finding out more about your approach. So is your method available for other teachers to use or is this just something that you use with your students? No, it's absolutely available. I would love more teachers to try it out. If you go to my website, hoffmanacademy.com, uh, you can browse all of our lessons for free, our uh, video lessons. I have over 300 that go through the method. And then there are method books also for sale from the website if you navigate to the store from my website and then go to the Hoffman Method Books area of the store. Uh, you can find 16 units that start with hot cross buns and brings you all the way up to playing Bach. Fantastic. Well, I hope people will go and check that out. If this has resonated with you and, and sounds like an approach that makes sense to you, uh, as I hope it has, um, certainly has for me, just, just with, with the research that you've clearly done. I mean, you're, you know, clearly have a background. You've, you've done the work and looked at what's out there. You've looked at Orff and Kadai and Suzuki and gone, what are the best parts of all of these? Well, let's bring it together in something that's modern and approachable and that students really love and that will hopefully make them want to do their chores so they can go and play. Um, <laughs> then go and check out those resources. Uh, I commend them to you. So thank you very much for coming on the show, Joseph. It's really been great to connect with you. Thanks, Tim.